If you weren't too busy having fun back during the PlayStation 2 era, you might have caught wind of a little old game called Shadow of the Colossus. I was a bit too obsessed with Spyro and hanging up some of the worst, most word art posters of anime characters you've ever fucking seen on my bedroom wall at the time, so I only deigned to notice this title a bit later as I began my transition out of my weave phase, thank god. It's so rare for me to ever actually play games when they come out, rather I cling to the back of these trends like an errant can on the back of a wedding car, just tinkering about and smacking against the gravel, missing the days back when I used to be a vessel for Diet Coke or Heinz Beans or something. Released initially on the PlayStation 2 in 2005, Shadow of the Colossus enjoyed a faithful remaster in 2011 on the PlayStation 3 and then a very very tasty looking one on the PlayStation 4 in 2018, putting it neck and neck with The Last of Us for random re-releases that weren't asked for but I'll probably end up playing anyway. Developed by Japanese studio team Ico, also known for their previous game Ico, Shadow of the Colossus was their benchmark title for over a decade until the release of The Last Guardian in 2016, which was apparently okay but I don't remember it doing especially well, but I probably will play it one day. And for good reason, since Shadow of the Colossus has long since been considered a cornerstone of gaming, one of the greats in a distinctly unique style I've only ever seen replicated in small vague ways here and there. And how could you, really? Without basically ripping off the whole template, it's hard to take what you want to emulate from this game without being purely derivative. The game is a series of boss battles set in a world of surprising depth and history, punctuated by what could generously be described as downtime, but more accurately described as tilt-based horse simulator, because that damn animal controls like an RC car in a swamp. There are a few games that are actually fundamentally similar to Shadow of the Colossus. If you know any, give me a shout and I will put them on my ever-growing list. But weirdly, and I do mean weirdly, the closest similarity I would give to this game would be to something like Cuphead. Not in the sense of characters, or dialogue, or music, or story, or gameplay, combat, challenge. None of those actually important things, but more in a structural sense where the game is more or less a boss gauntlet with a bit of pretend in between. It's a format that brings with it its own strengths and weaknesses, but that depends on how much you're willing to pretend that the downtime in between these boss fights is anything more than the white space it is. But in regards to walking around long forgotten places, that weren't built for you, weren't meant for you, all meaning and structure lost, unrecognisable, abandoned by a culture you never catch a glimpse of, kind of like visiting a blockbuster, it's fairly unique. Unless you're one of those people that compares everything to Breath of the Wild, in which case, yeah, definitely, yeah, no, you're so right. Yeah, you know what? They do both have horses in them, yes. Yeah, you know what? Actually, I think you're, you're kind of right, in a way, in a way, Shadow of the Colossus did rip off Breath of the Wild. In a way. No, you're so right. Yeah, you're so right. Anyway, before I get started with the retrospective, please make sure to like the video if you enjoy it and subscribe to me here on YouTube. I make all sorts of gaming content and I most recently talked about the problem with walking simulators and will very soon be talking about Bloober's Blair Witch and what I believe to be the cardinal sin of gaming. So if you like media discussion, then this is absolutely the place for you. Moreover, thank you as always to my patrons who I accidentally forgot to thank in my last video, but sincerely hope they, as a collective, forgive me. My life truly is on the line. Patrons of every tier also get access to my five minute reviews where I take a game and talk about it in five minutes. This month so far we did Hades and Cuphead and around the time this video will be coming out we will be covering Overwatch and Greed. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, check out my Patreon for more details. But first, a little word from our sponsor. With over 6 million users, Atlas VPN is a free, unlimited VPN offering heavy duty protection against DDoS attacks and snooping, prevents ISP throttling, and allows you to swap your time zone for early access to time zone locked or region locked games and services. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a limited time offer, so check out the link in the description to learn more. Although I work in software, I, well, I mean, I'm I'm a web designer. I'm hardly technical, especially when it comes to VPNs, so I was happy to see how easy Atlas VPN is to use. You can connect anywhere from Belgium to Australia. I mean, those are the only two countries. And any concerns are immediately addressed by the support center. There's no technical jargon, no walls of text, just good help for users of any technical ability. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a massive discount. You can get a three year subscription for just under $2 a month, plus three months for free, all with a 30 day money back guarantee, exclusively with the link in my description or in the pinned comment. This deal won't last forever, so make the most of this limited time offer by clicking the link in the video description or my pinned comment below the video. Thank you Atlas VPN for sponsoring today's video. Anyway, with all that aside, let's get on with the video, and full spoilers for Shadow of the Colossus. 
So Shadow of the Colossus storytelling is pretty sparse, even for a video game. We begin the game as a young man, named Wanda, who is transporting a woman by horseback. She's dead, although I suppose she doesn't really look dead. The journey seems to take weeks and nothing ever falls off her or goes a weird colour, so maybe it's a special kind of dead, or an anime kind of death where you still look sleepy and actually a bit hot. Moreover, we are never told why, but there are plenty of theories as to why she is dead. Wanda rides across a long, long bridge. Seriously, there's a point in the game where you have to run back over it, it takes like 8 minutes and if you look away for even a moment and your finger drifts off the analogue stick you will fall right off. How do I know? Well you need it for a trophy obviously. Wanda wanders into a massive area of ruins and mountains and lakes and dried riverbeds like an Aztec industrial estate and arrives in some kind of temple. When he lays this woman down a voice speaks to him from the ceiling. The voice says that they will resurrect the girl if Wanda can kill 16 colossi that are dotted across the land. Not one to question why, Wanda nods and off he goes. And that's it. That's our story. Shadow of the Colossus is one of the best protagonists I've ever seen in gaming. Why? Because our main character, for all intents and purposes, our viewpoint into the game, never ever says a word. Well, besides his horse's name and the occasional wispy grunt, but through him we are offered the most skewed story probably ever. The depths of this man's willing ignorance knows no bounds. He's probably the worst possible character to be stuck to the back of, and let me tell you why. Wanda never communicates with us, and god I feel like I'm breaking up with him just saying that, but no, his communication skills are abhorrent. But. Honestly, he doesn't know we're there, so why would he know to communicate with us? I quite like that Wanda never says a word. I feel like so often in games and TV, characters will always have like a dummy character come along with them. Ugh. That they can exposit everything about the world too, which kind of gives the main character a reason to speak aloud. But Wanda is alone, and he behaves as though he is actually alone. And no, I don't mean like singing aloud or making weird noises to see how they sound in the silence of your flat. Not quite. But alone more in the sense that he doesn't feel the need to announce every single innermost thought he has in like a constant stream of consciousness. Every step of the way he more or less keeps his thoughts to himself. Wanda's inner machinations are a mystery. There's a whole lifetime behind those eyes that we don't learn a crumb about, but we know what he needs to know and as far as he's concerned, having the incredibly skewed approach of an unreliable narrator, nothing else matters beyond his specific purpose in these lands. So we learn nothing else about the world beyond Colossi exist and they must no longer exist, and then maybe the girl will speak to me. To compare, one of the worst narrators in gaming I've ever seen is the character Julia in Martha is Dead. I won't spoil the game here, but I did a video on it and I'll link it if you want to see what I'm getting at here. It's a load of shit, it's one of the worst games I've played. Although bear in mind the video is graphic and contains full spoilers for the game, but for the sake of argument, Julia spends all of her time talking in that game. Some story beats are just straight up told to us with accompanying subtitles for several minutes at a time, while a still image or simple animation just plays on screen. The way Julia is shown to be an unreliable narrator is that she will tell us something point blank and also show it to us physically in the world. For example, she might say, there is an apple on the table, and she will show us an apple physically sat on the table. Her dad will walk in and point at the apple and say there is an apple on the table. The news flicks on and the radio confirms that there is indeed an apple on the table. Yet later on in the epilogue she'll go, there wasn't really an apple on the table. And also the apple was a member of the Italian resistance and the apple was pregnant but also it was never pregnant because there was no apple. But there is an apple on the table. In Martha is Dead we are literally shown things as they are. Julia and the supporting cast will openly acknowledge it as it is. We might even see news articles and hear radio broadcasts that acknowledge these facts as facts. But then later on in the game our main character will suddenly go, oh silly me, I was wrong, there was no apple, and apparently we just have to sit back and clap at the incredible twists and insightful explorations. It gets to the point where the game snatches away organic learning and realisations from you. You can follow clues very carefully through a mystery, narrow down a selection of possibilities for your answer, and the game will just go, oh actually this never happened, something else happened, and you didn't see it and we didn't tell you about it. Tough luck. And all of your momentum of engagement is lost. Why bother to learn about something if it isn't going to reward you with answers that are earned. Too many games do that where the unreliable narrator is more a, a method to shoehorn in twists and reveals that are completely unearned because you don't have to write a good and well foreshadowed twist when you can just say that the character was misinformed the entire time or everything was a hallucination or a bad dream or just misremembered. Often they resort to your main character just having an undisclosed and undefined mental illness that they can then use to give the story dark themes 
themes. Because, you know, why write something clever when you can write something shit? Shadow of the Colossus's storytelling isn't like that, because it's good. There is a twist, per se, in Shadow of the Colossus, and it happens right at the end, but for some players who weren't fooled by the big disembodied voice, it didn't come as much of a surprise to them. It was a massive surprise to me, though, having the awareness of a brick. Basically, the disembodied voice, Dormin, is some long-sealed-away evil. He wants you to free him by killing the colossi that contain fragments of his soul. Wanda absorbs these fragments as he goes, and if you keep an eye on him, you'll see his eyes turning bloodshot and his skin covered by a web of black veins. He even grows horns. But you're never told that. You have to notice those details for yourself, and what this game does that I find quite clever is that it will show you the same two cutscenes every time you kill a colossus. Firstly, you'll see the death animation where the colossus collapses and the fragment of Dormin enters Wanda, and secondly, you'll see Wanda wake up back in the temple and Dormin will give him his next task. These cutscenes are more or less identical every time, which builds a repetition that I think is intended to make you complacent. You'll probably start to glaze over after a while, or just focus on the subtitles to to figure out your next clue, another helpful visual aid that keeps your eyes off Wanda, which means that Wanda's insidious changes won't be noticed by anyone but the most observant. God, this has just made me realise how much I don't miss puberty. All this for some random roasty. You're willing to put the world in danger for the sake of resurrecting a girl we aren't even sure knows Wanda. He might have just seen her from afar, or exhumed her from her grave because he liked the waxiness of her skin. Maybe he thought she smelled nice. Actually, I think the real strength of this game's story and setting and the real benefit of using an unreliable narrator or unreliable main protagonist in Shadow of the Colossus is that it's what we don't learn and what we are never allowed to learn that often is the most interesting part of this. Throughout this game we are introduced to a monolithic dead empire, country, civilization, who knows? We walk in the skeletal ruins of lost cities, through crumbling art and architecture, in places that were just not made for us to tread, made for bigger people who spoke different languages and had different goals. But Wanda's not there for that, so it's almost entirely inconsequential. We could just play this game in an Ikea, and fundamentally it would have made a difference. On my first playthroughs of Shadow of the Colossus I remember walking away so annoyed. Not because it was a bad game, in my opinion it's a very good game, but because I felt like it could have been so much more. You know, all this wasted potential. I wanted to know all about the people who lived here. I was obsessed with scouring the web for information, I looked at cut colossi, followed easter egg hunts, tried to find this legendary hidden content so many people insisted was tucked away somewhere within this game. These rumours were kind of cropping up as the internet was in its infancy. So it was back in the day when things like the San Andreas Sasquatch were genuinely being looked for. The only way to disprove a myth in a game was by rinsing that game so clean, breaking it in every single possible way, trying it with every single variable and trigger and objective slightly different, running experiments over and over again where every single thing you tried would just be a grain of difference from the last thing you tried, and then coming back with nothing. That was the only way you could essentially disprove a myth. But even then, there would be doubt that you'd missed something, some combination of things that got some easter egg to, to trigger or not. Because if you found the easter egg, you, you had conclusive proof that the easter egg existed, but if you couldn't find the easter egg, it wasn't conclusive proof because it could potentially still exist. People would spend years on these easter egg hunts. As for me, I was just angry about this lack of information for ages. I don't know why, just it rubbed me the wrong way and I felt personally slighted by the game's utter refusal to tell me everything I wanted to know about it. Yeah, I'm not one for nuance. For a while I really resented Wanda and his lack of interest in all the local landmarks, like why didn't you bring a guidebook, Wanda? Like, where's the TripAdvisor page for this massive temple? But this is the storytelling method that games like the Souls series later got so much credit for. Arriving on scene, long after the collapse of civilization, with a goal in mind that is only going to make the people in charge annoyed. And then just blundering through like an idiot and getting your muddy shoes all over the carpet. Wanda literally just walks in and like wrecks the place. No regard, no respect. No time to read when there's time to bleed. There's a lot of compliments for Dark Souls storytelling nowadays, this idea that you can piece together information from lots of little scraps, slowly building up a mental web of everything that's ever happened. But before Dark Souls storytelling, there was Demon's Souls storytelling. You'd know the absolute fundamentals, where you are, the names of the people you meet, their jobs, and since it's a Japanese game you always get told their blood type for some reason, but so many of the most basic questions about the world of Demon's Souls were just never answered. Man, I wish we'd had more to work with about Latria, I always wanted to know more about that place. But before Demon's 
Dragon Soul storytelling, there was Shadow of the Colossus storytelling, where nothing is described whatsoever. You can make all the theories you want, but there's no item description scrawled away at the end of an obscure quest line that would give you any degree of an answer. I don't think they tell you the character's blood type here either. A lot of the time in games you'll have your prize women, like Princess Peach, but it's definitely a bit of a chuckle to have a woman like Mono that comes along to serve the same function as a cold breakfast bagel or a really nice pillow. Don't get me wrong, the story would probably fall apart if Mono was awake and talking, mainly because Wanda would no longer have anybody to resurrect from the dead, but largely if Mono is awake, she and Wanda are able to talk, and then it might be less believable that Wanda is single-mindedly going for this if he can be challenged or reasoned with in any way. If Mono is there to say, what the fuck are you doing? Doing. Don't you think this is a bit suspicious? Wanda might have a crumb of self-reflection and the narrative just collapses. Instead, the game cuts out the middleman by having her lie there for the length of the story like a soft brick. I'm not even trying to communicate an annoyance here about representation. The game's old. I'd never expected to pass the Bechdel test. I'm just relieved they didn't have her assaulted for the sake of Wanda's character growth while Linkin Park plays loudly in the background. The most exposition we ever get from this group I'll refer to as the God Squad, but only because they seem to be some kind of religious sect whose sole purpose is to keep dormant locked away safely. They have cool masks, they know Wanda is about to get into some silly shit so they chase him, occasionally stopping to make observational comments and gravely nod to one another along the way. They make these comments in a fake language, something that's apparently an amalgamation of Japanese, English and Pig Latin, and it does really work. It sounds very convincing. The subtitles are in Papyrus, which unfortunately means this game has to score a whopping 0 out of 10 on all fronts, but I won't stop the review here because I know you little sluts of long form content and I've not finished talking about the narrative yet. Their immediate priority is stop stopping Wanda, so they'll exposit a little bit about that here and there, but most of their screen time is spent staring gravely into the distance and umming and ahhing together. They're not exactly going into an in-depth examination of the lands, the colossi, or even Dormin itself. The implication, or at least the implication I got from the game, is that the woman Mono was sacrificed for some kind of ritual. Maybe even the same ritual that keeps Dormin locked away, but that's a stretch. We're never told, we're not even told who she is to Wanda, his sister, wife, cousin, best friend, or maybe just a girl he stares out on the bus, but I do think think that really helps, because it allows you to kind of imprint yourself on Wanda and see the relationship between them that helps you get into his shoes the best. If you're more inclined towards platonic relationships, maybe you just see them as best friends. If you have a sister or a brother, maybe you see them as a sibling. If you're married to a woman, maybe that's how you see their relationship, maybe you see them as husband and wife. If you're a historian, maybe you think they were roommates. I think it's a really effective way of basically encouraging immediate empathy in your player base, particularly when the wider exposition can be so hot hostile. We are told nothing, more or less, so it's about what we see within the game about ourselves that we can relate to that ends up being the thing I think that helps us get through the game and helps us understand Wanda. It works though, and once I started to make peace with it, I started to appreciate the restraint. Through Wanda as our player insert, we see exactly what he cares about, which is basically nothing. A huge civilization rose and fell, there was a cataclysmic battle with an all-powerful entity that took every resource from that civilization to contain said entity. The civilization then collapsed under itself or fled, the lands were then just roped off and or forgotten about. These few colossi just kind of roam in the shadow of what used to be here. But Wanda doesn't care because he's out doing six stunts on his horse and showing Dormin his Skelectrix. The God Squad have probably dealt with people like Wanda so many times already. This might be just another Thursday for them. They probably got home to their family like, yeah, another teenager scaled the fence and tried to resurrect Dormin while they crack open a beer, put their feet up and neglect their children. We're potentially thousands of years later down the timeline, one of many, maybe many failed attempts to free Dormin and yet a close attempt, one they barely managed to stop, but still hardly the epicentre of the real story, which happened well before Wanda was even born, not addressed nor shown to us in any meaningful capacity. I think this is told to us really visually effectively through the colossi and their marks on the map. These dots, these little icons that denote the location of each colossi, probably collectively takes up like 2% of this map. The rest is white space as far as Wanda is concerned, and the filter we have to look at this game through is so frustrating sometimes, but it's effective and it's grounded in a reality where there genuinely just isn't a helpful narrator to tell us every last detail about the world we'd like to know. 
The Colossi are tertiary in the history of things, but they are our goal and purpose. Wanda won't investigate the ruins of this long dead civilization because he just doesn't care, and we, the helpless bystanders, are dragged along on his whim instead. They are the reason you'll likely be drawn to this game in the first place, but after a playthrough or two you'll realise just how insignificant they are in the grand scheme of things. Like an anti-aircraft missile left behind in the wake of a nuclear winter, it's not really the crux of the issue at all, albeit it does look quite cool. Still, the bosses in this game are unique in so many ways. They are colossal, as you can imagine, so they need to be climbed to be killed. The catch? They can only be killed by attacking them in specific weak points, so you can't just go ham at them from the ground with a bow and arrow, or stab their leg until they bleed to death. Their weak points are located around their body and need to be climbed to to be accessed. They're walking puzzles that need to be figured out. Some of the weak points are in plain sight, whereas some require armour to be destroyed for you to have access to them. The Colossus may need to be stunned or grounded, or environmental requirements might need to be met before you can have access to them. This is the kind of game where the main challenge lies almost entirely in the first playthrough when you're figuring all of this out. The game never changes in hard modes and time attacks beyond maybe adding an extra weak point here and there or pumping up enemy damage, so once you know what to do you've basically gotten 80% of what you can get out of this game, making a first playthrough a very thorough experience. This really is the kind of game where your first playthrough is the defining playthrough. It's all about discovery, seeing these colossi for the first time, figuring out how to beat them for the first time, uncovering the world for the first time, realising the twist for the first time, kind of how I imagine a first playthrough of Outer Wilds would be, except I've not played that game yet. Coming back to this game for future playthroughs, unless you're challenging yourself with hard mode or the time attacks, is more of an exercise in comfort gaming, kind of replaying something that you're like competent at and familiar with, which I actually occasionally do myself, albeit very occasionally. It's a shame there's not an opportunity to fight the Colossi any other way. The fights are definitely extremely specific in the steps you have to take in order to complete them. You know, there's there's no room for movement, there might be a few skips here and there, but largely you just do it in exactly the same steps every time. But I suppose if I wanted an opportunity to fight things my way, I could just play any other game. That's not to say that the first playthrough of Shadow of the Colossus isn't worth your time. Discovering every Colossus is insanely fun. There are small, medium, large and massive colossi. There are bipeds, quadrupeds and no peds. I don't know what no leg ones are called, but they're there. There are land dwellers, sand dwellers, sea dwellers, and sky dwellers. Some fights focus more on just climbing the thing and hitting it. Some focus more on using the environment to stun the colossi or have it stand up tall so that you can access its tongue or flip it on its back. They're all based on different entities too. Some normal animals, some mythological creatures, some straight up creature creatures. They've all got their own OSTs as well, which is awesome and makes each fight's tone so different and memorable. Every Colossus has its own visuals, vibe and personality. They look like they all sit around at the end of the day and share war stories and make fun of Pelagia for having half of her head ripped off. Like ancient sentinels that have stood the test of time, armour crumbling held together by magic, sweat and tears, having outlasted hundreds of battles against misguided idiots like Wanda. Some of the Colossi are more aggressive than others. Blue eyes indicate that they're passive, but they are angry when their eyes go red. Some of them are always passive, some of them are always angry, some of them are harder to aggro than others, whereas some are incredibly easy to aggro. My brother commented that their eyes were dead and empty and their armour was boring and that they felt robotic. I didn't really have the heart to tell them that they are robots of a kind, so naturally they do have dead and lifeless eyes. They're automatons at least. Maybe I'm just making excuses for a game. The fights all play out so differently and the visuals are so striking, but due to the way the controls in this game operate, some are definitely much more fun than others and it will wholeheartedly depend on what playstyle suits you best. And when I say playstyle, I mean whether you're skilled enough to steer that horse around without steering your controller through the close window and screaming so loud that your neighbours called the police. I've played through this game probably like 10 or so times by now, maybe more. I had the original version on the PlayStation 2 and I still get a little bit grumpy with the fights that require you to use aggro, your horse, but ultimately I'm alright with most of them by now. In my humble opinion, this game plays like hot shit. It's not especially wired in an intuitive way. For example, to sprint on your horse you have to tap triangle, and I play a lot of Rockstar games so I will usually go to tap X, and that will make Wanda just jump off and he will do this massive leap off the horse and then you have to call it over again, get it to stand still just so you can get back on the horse again. There's also a dodge button too that I just always seem to forget about. Some people acclimate really well to this game, it just works with what they expect, they just settle right in, they use the controls perfectly. Some people, like me, take two or three playthroughs before it starts to feel second nature. Some people, like my poor brother, just never get on with this game. It never ever works. The controls are always a barrier to access for them. 
But I understand it was probably quite challenging to make a game that had all of these fast-paced platforming and combat requirements, accounted for the scale of the colossi, and still felt right. The game not only has basic traversal, length and width of areas with light platforming, but also depth. Needing to scale colossi in a way that means you wind around them often involves a fuckload of misery. The grabbing and climbing could be so frustrating. Climbing walls was fine, but the monsters were so janky that I would get stuck on random hitboxes trying to jump from hand to hand or armour to arm. Especially the last boss. Fuck Fuck me. Sometimes you'll tell Wanda to climb in one direction and he'll just disregard, he won't care. Then his stamina runs out and he falls off and depending on the Colossus you're on you have a hell of a trial ahead just to get back onto it. The camera is absolutely your worst enemy here, especially on horseback. And nothing is as bad as that fucking horse. Aptly named Agro, your noble steed in Shadow of the Colossus was the source of my frustration every time. Often Agro isn't needed for fight and you can kind of leave her tied up outside like a dog out front of a corner shop. but. She's mandatory for a few of them, and they become an exercise in tilt resistance. Like, I think the Phalanx fight, Colossus number 13, looks amazing, but if I didn't absolutely pop a bollock getting my horse in position next to its fins every time I needed to jump aboard, or the turtle boss, which you need to lead around the arena until he stands on a geyser and tips over, or while well, he fires projectiles at you and aggro, which often left me writhing with rage. The Avion fight, number 5, was a bitch for me, because on my PlayStation 2 version, the game would crash every single time I fell off this. The bird colossus every time, and I would have to run over from a nearby save every single go around. It was enough to make me lose my nut. Sure, he ended up only taking a few tries, but it was a bloated few hours when the game literally couldn't handle me falling off a bird enemy that flies and specifically tries to make me fall off. The fight is fun beyond that, and I love it now, it's one of my favourites, but that was such a major issue for me that it left a bad taste in my mouth for a long time. Sometimes the game will crash on your way to a fight, and since there are only manual saves at altars, it will depend in entirely on how fastidiously you've been making said saves up to this point. Otherwise, it's fairly stable. I never remembered any bad loading times, any bugs or glitches, any screen tearing or frame rate drops, just the occasional crash. So the game goes ham, or it doesn't go at all. One of my favourite designs is Pelagia, the one with half its head ripped off, but if piloting that thing around by its teeth isn't one of the most irritating parts of this game, and if you take too long, she'll just tip you into the water. I was fairly underwhelmed by the look of the Aztec dog one in the temple, but the platforming there is super fun, whereas the cat one that's scared of fire, you had better kill in one single cycle, because trying to get back up to that platform while it's chasing you and stun locking you to death is an exercise in leg breaking patience. The barber's fight, the bloke with the beard who peeks down under the temple you hide beneath, scared the shit out of me when he first stooped down and stared at me with those dead eyes, but his fight was really fun. Dirge, the sand snake, is also a test of horse handling expertise, and on the original version of the game on PlayStation 2, game over screens would have a huge zoomed in picture of the Colossus's face and Dirge's was the first one I saw, and it made me scream with how immediate it was. That thing was a jump scare. Originally there were plans to be like 42 colossi, I can't remember, and I also just don't care, but when I first played this game I was utterly distraught that there weren't more colossi. Like, my dopamine receptors had been activated, my serotonin, and I just wanted more of the same thing. Forever. I used to rinse the Wikipedia pages clean on all the cut colossi, because a few of them got made, and if you glitch out of bounds, I think you can find one of the cut colossi's arena. I think it might have been the griffin, but there was like a spider, a monkey, a devil, amongst a quite a few others that were not only sketched and fleshed out, but actually like modelled for the game itself. People would spend months trying to find these colossi, absolutely insistent that they were hidden somewhere on the map or roped off by some kind of random objective, you know, finding all the lizards, finding all the fruit, maybe finding like a hidden shrine or something, paragliding into a certain direction. They actually did create a few of these landmarks as well, which I think just kind of added to the intrigue, but they ended up just kind of being empty landmarks to not only add a lot of flavour to the land, but also I think to fuel said intrigue. It was awesome, but bittersweet. But now, in my old age and my wisdom, I think 16 colossi is very fair, especially with all the replay value the game gives you. For example, I got the platinum on this and you have to beat every colossus on normal, hard, normal time attack, hard time attack, and then do a speedrun. And you also have to do a few extra playthroughs to grind to maximum stamina and health so that you can climb the tower, so if you had to do at least 5 playthroughs of 42 colossi, that would be kind of rude. Sure, there is downtime between them, but it's more travel time and sometimes the travel can be just as annoying as the fights when the routes aren't 
especially clear. Your horse will sometimes just bolt at nothing, getting all wanky and coming to a stop and refusing to move. There's a few colossi that you follow the way to very faithfully, but it will be deceptive, so you'll wind up in the arse end of nowhere and the horse will be getting stuck on everything, and you'll realise that you have to go all the way back the way you came because this is secretly a dead end, and at that point it would be a coin toss on whether I just put the game down for the day right there. The game is very explorable, and especially on the PlayStation 2 era I would spend hours running around the map, but it never really encourages exploration. That has to be something you take an interest in yourself. You'll see some weird ruin or tower in the distance and go take a look at it, probably on your way to the other Colossi or in New Game Plus when you finally have a minute to breathe, but ultimately it will be a purely visual sightseeing mission and you get to gawk at something pretty for a bit which is fine by me, but that horse man, it will make you miserable. When I was trying to get to number 6 for the first time I got stuck in some forest and Agro was getting stuck on all the roots and getting turned around, refusing to walk too close to the tree trunks that were littering this place as it was a forest, constantly kicking off and wheeling her head away, refusing to walk forwards. My god, I wanted to ping my controller off the nearest wall. This mid downtime between bosses creates a strange phenomenon, where it's not relaxing whatsoever in some cases, or it will be a pretty neutral experience overall, which leaves only the frustration of each boss to squat over you. With the absence of real smooth gameplay between fights, you're throwing yourself at new things over and over again, which is why I compared this game to Cuphead before, because I found the same sentiment with that game as well. Many people I spoke to who were playing these games for the first time found themselves in a weird situation where a boss will only take them 20 minutes, but they will be so tilted from the previous few and the mad sprint between them that they were getting really angry with it. Then suddenly they'd sit back like, oh, that only took one try, and then they'd feel a fool for losing their shit. Don't worry, friend, we've all been there. This game does benefit from you taking lots of breaks for that kind of reason, especially if you're super excited to see the upcoming bosses like I was when I first played. But I think the excitement of seeing these bosses for the first time is very natural, you know? It's kind of what the game's all about, like what's up next, you know, you always, always want to just see the next one just before you go to bed, you're like, oh I just want, just want to see the next Colossus. But once that initial honeymoon period is over, the game does give you some further goals that are kind of worthwhile. Hard mode is available, plus normal and hard mode time attacks, which are essentially like timed runs that you can do. These are super fun, I love speed runs, and they give you some really good items that you can use for future playthroughs, but there is one problem. The items you get in the time trials can't be used in future time trials, only in future playthroughs, which I get since they don't want power creep and it means you have to do the colossi in a specific order and later colossi time trials would be too easy, but at the same time, by the time you've done normal, normal time attack, hard time attack, you've already finished the game three times, four if you've played on hard mode as well. To get the best item in the game you need to beat every colossus on hard time attack, and while there is an exploit you can use to trick the game into thinking you've done that, it's bold to assume that your player will still want to play after a third full playthrough of this game, special items or otherwise. Every Colossus can only be killed in one single way, so it becomes an exercise in just doing the same thing again, but slightly more efficiently every time. There might be some skips or some AI exploits you can use to get things done faster, but ultimately it's the same fight every single playthrough. Not many people keep playing this game after the first playthrough. Sure, there are some people absolutely beating their keys in the comments section right now to tell me they've played this game 68,000 times and they have the current world record in every category and it's their favourite game, it's the only thing they've played for the last 15 years, but that can be said for every game on the planet. Every game in existence is going to have some people that have played it a ridiculous number of times. And don't get me wrong, that's cool. I have 100 percent in Spyro like a thousand times. I mean, I'm on board. But unfortunately, it is a minority. For 99% of players, grappling with a control scheme that is not particularly smooth or accommodating, I would be surprised if like three-fifths of the players that played this game finished it. Beyond completionists or huge fans of the game, I doubt many at all are going to bother with the time trials or the 100% either. Consequently, Shadow of the Colossus is one of those games that puts incredible gear at the end of like the entire active period you would find any benefit from using it. And then suddenly you have a one-shot sword that you're too much of a pro to need, and you'll have beaten the Colossi so many times that you won't need any help to kill them, and the sword begins to serve more as a way to make the fight so easy that they become boring. The game becomes more about running to the Colossi, stabbing them one single time, watching the cutscene, running to the next one. You spend more time on horseback than you do actually in any kind of meaningful combat. Sure, you could argue giving the player the sword any early earlier cheapens the use of the sword for them, and I would agree, I think that would cheapen the use of the sword. Or you could just use it on the Colossi you hate, I don't know. I felt like it was a bit too late to earn to be worthwhile. In the remake, Bluepoint did add a sword that you would get if you collected every single one of these very obscurely hidden coins, and when I say obscurely hidden they were very obscurely hidden. Some of 
them were only accessible during their relevant boss fights. Some of them felt like they were out of bounds, even if they weren't necessarily out of bounds. Some of them required like extremely precise jumps off things that you would never even consider you needed to jump off. And once you've got all of these, you got a special sword, I think. I think that the one-shot sword you get should be from something like that, where it's down to a player's prerogative whether or not they want to go the extra mile to find the sword early, or whether it's something that they just kind of want to clean up and collect later on. Either way, you can put the effort in now, because you still have to do one single full playthrough because you have to jump off some of the later bosses of arenas, so you still have to do every single fight legit at least one time around, but then it becomes a completely optional reward that you can get for going the extra mile. Ultimately, Shadow of the Colossus was a staple for what it was and what it did. Did that staple come with a shit ton of mechanical issues that meant some of its more frustrating moments were like trying to pilot a teacup ride through the Gobi Desert? Yes. Should it dissuade you from trying it? No. In my opinion, this is one of those games that is always worth the effort. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like, comment, and subscribe for more. I post gaming content as often as I can, usually twice per month, so if that sounds like something you'd enjoy, don't forget to sub here and you will never miss another video. Check out my social links, including Patreon and Twitch channel in the description below. I stream as often as I can, although I've taken a big break this month, so if you're around, I'll catch you there. Keep an eye out for my upcoming video on the Blair Witch game by Bloober, and I'll see you in the next one.